Good afternoon, everyone, and you're all very welcome back to um, our conference. Um, from the response that we have received over lunch, it would suggest that a lot of you managed to get out and put the theory into practice. So um, we've been very quickly trying to put some of the photographs that you sent us in up onto a slide. Um, there we go. So there are some of the lovely photographs you sent in, some out with families, a lot out with dogs, a lots of beautiful places. But we have chosen the winner as Gail McCackney. Gail, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. After all, this uh, conference is all about getting out into the outdoors, in your community, with your family. So Gail, congratulations. We will get your email from, from you and Shane O'Mara's book in praise of walking will be sent to you right away. So thanks very much everyone for just joining in on that little bit of fun uh, over lunchtime. So this afternoon really is all about sharing good practice. Um, with one another. And so we're going to start off this afternoon with three presentations, one on Darkly, followed by Gosford, and then the Quilka de Clanish project. Um, we then have uh, our fifth ministerial input into the conference. And then after that, we will close the conference and everyone will go out into their individual breakout rooms. Uh, the breakout rooms really just give you all an opportunity to uh, share your own thoughts and your own sight, your own insights and your own reflections and experiences on what you've heard today. Um, <clears throat> so in your easing, you should have received your breakout room link. Um, and again, um, the, the four breakout rooms are research and policy, the way forward. Breakout room two is on communicating the value of local trails and green space. Three is about the benefits and challenges of master planning. And four is about working and walking together, local residents and landowners. Uh, we do hope to record all of the breakout sessions as well, and it'll all be available on Outdoor Recreation NI's YouTube channel. So we are going to just start this afternoon's presentations then uh, by handing over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is one of our project officers, and she's going to do a presentation on the value and impact of the Darkly Community Trail. Thanks, Carolyn, and good afternoon, everyone. So over the next 20 minutes, I want to give you a brief example of how we can communicate the value and impact of green space and trails using Darkly Forest as a case study. And to help with this, I'm going to be joined in a bit by my colleague Claire Saunders and Willie Monaghan of Darkly Rural Community Group. Back in 2018, five multi-use trails were opened up in Darkly Forest through funding from ABC Borough Council Sport NI and deer via the Tripsy Fund. Because of its recent developments and rural location, we decided to include it as one of our three pilot sites for developing an impact survey for all new trails. At this stage, I should say that this research was supported by 56 Degree Insight. So thank you very much, Duncan, for all your expertise on this project. But first I have a question for you. How should we try to determine and articulate the value of green space and trails to communities and to people's lives? Is it through the human story or is it through trying to measure and quantify that impact? Well, for me, it's both. And no matter what the quantitative figure may be, the qualitative story is just as important. And that's probably been no more apparent than over the last year. And all of us have our own stories, the stories of friends and family who have relied on nature and getting outside and being active for their own health and well-being. And for that reason, we are going to hear the human story first on the value of Darkly Forest Community Trail before we look at how we try to measure that impact. And my colleague Claire Saunders, who did a lot of the heavy lifting on this research, caught up recently with Willie Monaghan from Darkly Rural Community Group to find out more about how the forest was opened up and the impact it has made for the local community. 
Hi Willie, um, thank you for joining me today. Um, we're just trying to have a chat about Darkley and just find out a little bit more about the community and the forest um, and what the trails have meant for you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Darkley the village itself and um, so that we know a little bit more about it? Well, Darkley is a small village, um, about half a mile from the border with County Monaghan in, in, in St County Armagh. And um, Darkley has always been seen as an area forgotten. Um, I don't, I don't like the, the the phrase. I was calling the forgotten village, but often it, it it did seem like that. I mean, services would have been very very poor, and um, it would have very high social deprivation. And tell me a little bit about then, um, Willie, how the community group got involved with the development of the forest and trying to get the forest opened um, for the local area? Well, the first I really thought about was I, I, I met Outdoor Recreation. We were at a meeting in Darkly one time in October 2014. And we got a brief little bit about it, about the idea and what was being mooted at the time. And then we roll on to the 2017 when our group did constitute. And then I met Outdoor Recreation again. They, they, they had the plans to view in Darkly Primary School. And I went along then to say that I was a community representative and if there was anything that we could do to help. And at that stage, it seemed to be stuck. Um, the plans were there, the proposals was there, um, but it, it was stuck in terms of um, who was going to use it, support from the community and so on. And I guess our group come along at the right time for this project because we were doing a survey at the time and we did speak to outdoor recreation and I and, and we agreed to put a couple of questions about the forest into our survey. We were doing a survey for our own action plan um, yeah. and, and basically we said we could, so then that information was passed to outdoor recreation and I and then they were able to then go to funders and say listen here is a survey that has been done in which people have asked for for for, for trails and this and that. So it was a really solid piece of research for outdoor recreation. And then obviously then they were seeking the funding from 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 whoever they were seeking the funding of. And I know that one of the groups was Sport uh, Sport NA. Sport uh, NA Tripsy, yeah. I think funded yeah. it. And um I think you know um the survey that you guys done really helped you know push the trail development along um with the councils and stuff. So like it was great to to get that support from the local community groups to build the trails. Brilliant. And I mean that 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 that's what we were about and that's what we are about. You know, we are about trying our best to get into our area um as much services and facilities as, as we as we can. So I mean it, it seemed to be stuck at that point. Um I remember doing uh helping with a survey for outdoor recreation NA because we really built up a link and a relationship very, very quickly because, you know, these things, there was funding available. <laughs> Nobody knew how long for, so things sort of moved on very, very, very quickly. And I remember helping with a survey and I remember we were targeting the groups of over 50s and females and those with disabilities. And I mean, we had to, we had to put all that information in, but I mean, we had tremendous support from so many clubs, but it was a community group that went out and sought um, the support of all those groups. And I think we ended up with up on 25 groups who all gave how many numbers they had in them, how many members they had and how often they trained and how often they would use it. And I think that's really what 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 really got it over the over the end line. Now, I mean, everything was there long before our group came into being, but we are very proud that we were able to have uh, to co contribute to yeah. what was already a fantastic plan. Um, but I mean, it was a fantastic plan that we really got behind because it was so exciting. And to have this on our doorstep, we couldn't we couldn't but help and, and, and get it over there because I mean, it was just so, so, so important that we got this facility. Well, no, that's great. And, you know, obviously now the trails opened officially and uh, I think it was like the end of um, 2018 in October time. Um, and they've been in for, you know, a couple of years now. So can you tell us a little bit about the impact of the trails in the forest and, and what that has meant for local people and their sort of physical and mental well-being? Well, first of all, if anybody knows, knows darkly, it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you, you could be driving along, you could be out for a Sunday drive, 
you're out in the middle of the hills around the Callan Valley and you turn a corner and there's a village. And a lot of people have actually said that to me, this village just come out of nowhere. But the reason being, it was built in that location because of the water power and then for housing the workers. It's not really on the road to anywhere. And I have often said to people, unless you have business to be in Darkley or relatives in Darkley, you may never be in Darkley. It's so, so rural. And in terms of in terms of a built up area, it's probably the in, in the ABC area, it's the southernmost uh, populated area in our in our council area in ABC. We're right on the border with, with, with County Monaghan. I mean, you look from Darkley over and you're looking in the County Monaghan. So that, that, that's how close we are. We are so rural, the roads are so bad. If you if you were to go out and chance yourself on the roads walking or running, I could say you're taking your life in your hands. So really, the so fact- like People use the forest then instead of going on the roads absolutely, and stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. So there, there's a, a number, uh, I mean, so, so many people who actually started exercising because the past were put in. People who had never walked, older people who had stopped walking, the roads had got too dangerous, especially mm -hmm. tractors flying, cars flying here, there and everywhere. Um, they, they actually came out and started walking. I spoke to so many people um, who who actually were quite open with me and, and, and said that they had a problem with their weight, and, but they couldn't get out to get it shifted. And they started using Darkly Forest and okay. they started they started walking and then they started. Some of them just walked and lost lost weight, which is obviously good for their mental health. I'm, their their physical health and their mental health because I mean you know how it is if you're struggling with with, with weight um I mean I have, I have had that myself um and I mean it does get you down so I mean losing losing the weight becoming happier in their selves in mm -hmm. their body and and then mentally the the effect that has had on them is, is just phenomenal but I mean so many of them told me you know they lost weight some of them went on jogging and then went and running and now I see them names popping up left, right, and centre doing ten k's, runs in Armagh, <laughs> park runs, but they still always come back to Darkly Forest. So it has been great in that regard. Well, what has now, like obviously since COVID nineteen has come in, what has the trails meant to the community since that change in the whole environment for everybody? Um, in a nutshell, it means we need a bigger car park <laughs> or possibly another another a, a massive extension because I can tell you that although it was well used previously to COVID, during COVID, the forest has been a hive. Now, mm. I know that would maybe you're, you're talking about COVID and social distancing um, and, and you're thinking maybe, you know, that sort of image of a hive being crowded. It's not because you can go to Darkly Forest and the car park could be completely full and you might not meet one person. It's so well spread out um, that, you, that you might not. But more times than enough, you do meet some families. And <laughs> if I told you how many times somebody has turned around and says, because I would take those, me and the wife and four children, um, the times we've met other families and it goes, oh, real people. Real people, they haven't been out of the house except in Darkly Forest, you know, because they've been good. They've been keeping home and, and adhering to the guidelines. And the only time they get out is to go to, like, I mean, that's, that's massive in fact. And I know then you would stand at a distance talking to, to people, uh, people you maybe haven't seen in a long time. And one thing that always strikes me is they talk about the cabin fever and the frustrations, especially when they're maybe trying to work from home and home schooling, uh, this remote learning and remote teaching going on. And I mean, I know I know all the very life for them and then I'm remote teaching as well. You know, your house can become very much uh, a melting pot for a lot of negative feeling. Um, everybody crammed in and getting on each other's nerves. And rather than exploding, what people have been doing is getting in their car and going to Darkly Forest. And they have said it just makes all the difference. It really, really clears the head. Their their level, their blood pressure level comes way, 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 way down. And, and they just love it. And I mean, it's everything. It's walking through the trees. It's meeting other people. It's the views of the lakes. It's down by the river. 
It's the old part of the forest. It's the wildlife. If you're lucky, you'll see uh, there's a couple of families of red squirrels. There's a massive family of, of, of jays, jay the birds. There's tree creepers. So the wildlife that's, that's in there is in abundance as well. It just, it has so much and it has so much potential. I mean, it can really, we can really do so, so much more. But what we have there at the moment is fantastic, but there's so much potential for more, yeah. Well, listen, um, Willie, thank you so much for, you know, chatting to me and sort of filling us in and telling us more about Darkly. It's been great to hear sort of from your perspective what's been going on and how it's developed and how it's changed and, um, you know, how beneficial it's been for the local community. So um, thank you very much for your time today. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Claire and Willie. And as you can imagine, Willie had a lot more to say, and that full interview can be viewed by the easing that will go out after the conference. So alongside the human story, there is also a vital role for data collection and sharing in our sector's evidence. And it's really important how this data is translated to help with decision making and to shape and inform policy and practice. This has just been one part of the evidence base that we have been pursuing and this morning you heard about the broader population wide, wide research that we are doing with the support of DERA and SORG. But with so many competing demands on public spending, it is crucial that we make a persuasive case for the value of green space and trails in a way that is credible and convincing and that speaks the language of government and economists. Increasingly, physical activity and the outdoors are being viewed through a social and economic lens to determine the public value of them. And more recently, we're hearing a lot about, for example, natural capital. So while everyone at this conference may believe the value of being active outdoors, we are sometimes challenged to provide evidence of that. And making persuasive arguments is absolutely key to protecting, but also hopefully growing the resource base for outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland mean that we are able to offer more opportunities for more people to be active more often in the outdoors. So with that in mind, the aim of this pilot evolved to try and quantify the value of Darkley Forest Community Trail. So for this, we use the social return on investment model, and this is a standardised and recognised framework for measuring non-financial benefits. It's also known as SROI, and with SROI, it's important not to overclaim and to be transparent with your method. There's no point having these heroic figures, but with no explanation of how they were arrived at. And I want to go over now how we applied the SROI framework to measure the value of Darkly Forest Community Trail. So firstly, we had to be able to measure user numbers, and we did this simply through the automated people counters that are on site. Secondly, we had to determine what positive outcomes to measure. We decided to include physical health benefits, mental health and well-being, and environmental and learning benefits. Then thirdly, we had to identify what's called dead weight and displacement and to account for these. So dead weight is positive outcomes which would have happened in any case. So for example, users may have gained benefits elsewhere if the trail did not exist. And displacement is similar, it looks at positive outcomes achieved at the expense of another. So for example, if the trail didn't exist, users would take part in other activities that provided similar benefits. And it's really important that these are subtracted from those reporting benefits, so as our, um, our figure is not exaggerated. And then we had to design and conduct the survey. So for the survey, we included 21 questions, and this took about 10 minutes to complete, and overall we had 213 completions and this was done during last month. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 restrictions, we had to stick to online surveying by using local community groups and social media pages. Um, but ideally, we would have had a mixture of online and on-site surveying. Then we had to source financial proxies for each positive outcome. So for physical health, we looked at the cost of a local swimming or gym session. For mental health and wellbeing, we looked at the cost of a social group or being a member um, of a club. And then for environment benefits, we looked at the cost of conservation holidays per hour. And then for learning, we looked at the cost of outdoor learning sessions or entering space to National Trust sites. And then lastly, we had to obtain the construction costs to create the path. And for Darkly, we know that the construction cost was 234,000 
570 pounds. So that was the method that was used, and now we'll look at the results. So from the data counter, we know that the total number of visits to the trail in 2020 was 20,617. And from the survey, we know, and this is quite interesting, that the average number of visits per year per user is 60, which means that we have an estimate of trail users in the round 344 per year. And then moving on to look at accounting for and subtracting dead weight. In the survey, we had 27% who agreed that if the trail didn't exist, they would probably do the same activities somewhere else. So we have to take them away from the original 20,617, which means then in terms of taking the number of visits forward and look at the uh, positive outcomes, we're looking at 15,050 visits. So firstly, in terms of physical health benefits, we have a high and a low figure, and I'll talk that through with you now. So in terms of the high figure, the survey showed that 87% of visits involve physical activity and 79% rated their health and fitness as better since the trail opened. The percentage of users meeting the chief medical officer or CMO targets for physical activity to reap health benefits was 33% through all activity at the trail or elsewhere. And the percentage of users achieving CMO targets due only to activity at the trail was 16%. Now we have gone with the low scenario because the CMO and the World Health Organization recommends that adults do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity and to achieve physical health benefits. And this is kind of the minimum requirement. So therefore, in terms of visits that go through to the valuation stage for health benefits, we include 2,408 visits. And then moving on to well-being benefits, the survey also included subjective well-being measures and the percentage of respondents who strongly agreed that the community trail made them feel cheerful and in good spirits or calm or relaxed or active and vigorous was 83%. And then in terms of environmental benefits, 66% strongly agreed that the trail made them feel closer to nature. And finally, in terms of learning benefits, the percentage strongly agreeing that they learnt about nature or their local heritage through the trail was 47%. So we take all of these numbers of visits for each positive outcome, and we'll move through now to look at the valuation. So when it comes to the valuation, we have to take the total number of visits for each positive outcome, and we have to multiply them by the financial proxies. So along the left hand side of your screen, are the four different positive outcomes that we looked at. And then on the next column, we have the financial proxies. And the visits and the financial proxies are multiplied. And this gives us the total value for each of the positive outcomes. And you can see that this totals to £93,611 for one year. The chart below me shows that after five years, the social value generated will be over £468,000, which equates to one pound spent equals two pounds return. And after 10 years, this rises to over £936,000, which equates to four pounds return. But given that the typical lifespan of a trail is about 25 years, this means that for every one pound spent to create the Darkley Forest Community Trail, it will generate 10 pounds over 25 years in return across physical health, well-being, environmental and learning benefits. So the total social value generated from this community trail is 2,340,275 pounds, which is a social return investment of one pound spent equals 10 pounds return. And that sounds like a very sound investment indeed. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope there's two things that you take away from this session. Firstly, that telling the human story is so important when we try to communicate the value and impact of local trails, and that should never be forgotten. But it's also important to try and measure and monetize value so that we can build an evidence base that speaks the language of decision makers and that can be persuasive in shaping and informing policy and practice. And keep that figure in mind that you heard today in relation to Darkly Forest. 
that one pound spent will generate 10 pounds in social value over the lifespan of the trails. Please also look out for the pilot reports on Darkley, Bunkers Hill and Balmahinch Rugby Family Trail that will go up on our website soon. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me using the email address below. I hope you find this session useful and Claire, Willie and myself look forward to continuing the conversation in breakout room two later. Thank you and back to you, Carolyn. Elizabeth, Willie and Claire, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, for those of you online that maybe joined us at our Power of Walking conference, you may remember that I give uh, a presentation very much on the human story of Darkly and now it's just brilliant to see how we can now progress and have that again hard evidence for the first time social return on investment figures um, you know and if any of the funders of that project are online which was Sport NI, Tripsy and uh, Tripsy part of DERA and ABC Council, you know, I really do think what Elizabeth has shown us today that you really have invested in a very, very sound project. So as Elizabeth said, we've just started to do some work, uh, social return on investment research on some of the community trails that we've been working on, but we would love to do all of them uh, because I think uh, the evidence that we're getting back just proves just how important those trails are to have doorstep opportunities for safe off-road walking close to where people live. Um, so hopefully in the future, we'll be able to bring you back some more case studies of the community trails. But thank you again very much to Elizabeth, Willie and to Claire for that presentation. So we're going to move on to our second presentation of the afternoon, uh, staying in the Armagh area again. Uh, Fiona uh, from Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland is going to present with Greg Fearson and Aubrey Bingham, uh, just telling us a wee bit about the story of Gosford Forest. So several years ago when we got involved in Gosford Forest, it was very much an underused uh, space for outdoor recreation. But uh, as Fiona will now tell you, doing a master plan for the forest has completely transformed now the recreational facilities on that site. So we'll pass over to Fiona. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fiona Millen and I am Joint Head of Projects at Outdoor Recreation NI. Today I will be taking you through the story of Gosford's development in the last six years, a project that I have been involved in from the beginning. Gosford Forest is one of only five designated forest parks in Northern Ireland. The forest is on the doorsteps of Market Hill, a little town that is home to about 1,600 people in County Armagh. It first opened to the public in 1960s when it was acquired by the Forest Service, but before that the forest was the former domain and estate of the Atchison family, otherwise known as the Earls of Gosford. Today the forest is also well known as the home of the Armagh Show, an agricultural event that takes place every year and attracts about 20,000 people over the course of two days in a non-Covid year of course. In the past, Gosford was extremely popular with day visitors. People loved Gosford and there is a whole generation of people out there who have very fond memories of caravanning holidays and days out with their family, visiting the ducks and the deer and just generally having a nice time visiting the walled garden, garden and having picnics. But the forest has changed a lot since then. From about the later 2000s, the forest began to suffer from a lack of love and investment as resources were pulled back and the priorities of commercial forestry took over. For a long time, the forest lay degrading and unmaintained and average numbers, this showed in the average numbers with numbers dwindling. Up until that is, the council began to show an interest in 2015 and development really started in 2019. Today, as a result of council intervention, guided by Outdoor Recreation NI's master plan, the forest is once again a thriving hub of life and activity with visitors numbers now in the hundreds of thousands. 
So one of the advantages of virtual conferencing is that things can be pre-recorded in advance. So I've chosen to tell the story of Gosford through a variety of mediums, supported by lots of lovely photos and videos. To begin with, I'll give a brief PowerPoint presentation explaining how the master plan, both the output and the process, has been the power tool to delivering Council's vision for Gosford Forest Park. Then I'll give an interview with Greg Fearson, pre-recorded of course. Greg Fearson is Outdoor Leisure Manager at Armagh, Banbridge and Craig Avonburgh Council. Greg and I will discuss Council's motivations for developing Gosford, the impact that the project has had, and then finish with a chat about what's ahead in Gosford's future. And lastly, I will finish with a very brief but uplifting interview with Aubrey Bingham from Disability Sport Northern Ireland, and we'll talk about All Out Trekking, a programme that is at Gosford and involves a range of buggies and equipment that allow people with disabilities to get out on the walk trails and the mountain bike trails, just like everybody else. A true example of a happy and healthy community. In this first segment, then, I want to take you through the planning and preparation of our master plan for the Forest Park. Put simply, a master plan is a development plan for your site. It has three critical elements. It has a map or a drawing to show the proposed future layout of your site. It has costs of those associated developments, and it has a time frame against those developments. What this simple explanation doesn't cover is the extensive amount of research and work that goes into producing a master plan. If you think of an iceberg, 90% of the mass is the bit that you don't see, the bit below the water. A master plan is just the same. 90% of the plan is the process, the working out, the consultation, the individual elements of the costings, mapping, field work, options, appraisals, etc., etc. The results of that work, what the client sees as the output, the map, the report, the time frame, that's only 10% of the master plan. So in this short presentation, what I hope to do is summarise all of that in the context of Gosford, telling you what we did, how we did it, and the results that it has had. The Council's vision for Gosford was, was twofold, really. It was to enhance the forest as a local recreational resource, but also to create a signature tourism attraction for international visitors and domestic visitors as well, coming from both the council area and further afield within Northern Ireland. What council lacked was a master plan. So as Greg will say later on, council commissioned us to prepare this plan in 2016, a plan that would identify the priorities and set out the costs and the phases of development. So how did we do this? We took what we already knew from previous studies of the forest and identified the priorities for development. We spent almost a year, I spent almost a year, walking every inch of the forest. We consulted and re-engaged with the local community, current users, statutory agencies such as the Environment Agency and Built Heritage, Road Service, neighbouring residents, etc, etc. And we spent considerable time researching comparable sites in the UK and Ireland and benchmarking the individual elements which were key to their success. We also actually took the councillors um, of Armagh City Council, as it was then, over to a number of those key sites so they could get a real feel for what Gosford could be. We identified what the visitor profile was so that all of our recommendations had a, had a visitor focused and we weren't just doing things because we could. And finally, once we had the proposals, we worked with specialists such as ecologists, engineers, landscape architects and others to prepare detailed drawings, plans and supporting costs for our recommendations. But first, what were the proposals? The proposals really fell into three main themes or, or areas. It was the first was product and attractions, which included the development of a new trail system made up of enhancement of existing and new trail as well. We wanted to develop Ireland's greatest adventure play trail and potentially in the future a high ropes course or a treetop aerial walkway, which is very much an aspirational thing. The other theme or area was visitor services and facilities. And the main recommendation here was the provision of a visitor centre. So currently Gosford doesn't have a visitor centre at all. The only facility that it has really 
is toilet block and also some mobile coffee catering, a, a coffee cart type establishment. What we also recommended, as well as the visitor centre, was a complete review of the parking, both in terms of capacity and the charging system. We also have already undertaken, and it was one of our key elements, was a forest rebrand to really just show the new direction and the new life that was going to be breathed into the forest and under new management of the council and no longer forest service. We recommended a completely new suite of signage and interpretation to show this. And in the future, again, the potential for forest holiday type accommodation, extending the current caravan park and upgrading the facilities so that they are very much in line with the modern quality, potential for bike hire and a really good, robust, engaging programme of events. In terms of spatial layout, we recommended a new entrance and associated traffic flow, reduce the deer herd so that you could utilise more of the open parkland, remove the heritage poultry pens and the rare breed pens that were once a very much loved attraction, but no longer really serve that function anymore. And again, extend the caravan park and upgrade the facilities there. And just to say, it wasn't all about development. In fact, we were very much influenced by the site sensitivities in relation to both people and place. Gosford Castle, for example, is a private dwelling with multiple res residents, which we had to be mindful of. And physically, the home, the, the, the forest is also home to very unique built and natural heritage features. So we deliberately steered clear of certain areas and concentrated development in areas that were already experiencing high and regular use. In relation to the trails then, Outdoor Recreation and I worked with others, but we first prepared the concept design. We then employed a specialist trail design, a trail designer to produce the detailed design, which showed the exact trail lines on the ground identified what the technical trail features should be and, of course, the costs of the development of that as well. We utilised the Council's architect to prepare, prepare visualisations of the internal layout and external look of the new visitor centre, which helped towards estimating the costs of a new building. And we employed a team of landscape architects to prepare visualisations of our ideas for the layout of the visitor hub, to show the relationship of the proposed visitor flow between the car park, new visitor centre and wider forest park. We also employed consultant engineers to prepare technical drawings and specifications and costs for a new car park, a new road layout and a new, entr new entrance road. And all of this work contributed and fed in to the preparation of our final Gosford Master Plan. The next step then, once the master plan was complete, was to prepare or, or employ the services of an independent economist to prepare a Green Book economic appraisal on the master plan itself. And this ranged, this the options considered ranged from doing nothing to doing everything. And based on these two pieces of work combined, the council agreed on its development plan for the forest, as well as its internal capital. The development plan that the Council agreed on looked like this. So, phase one included the trails, the development of the new trail system, a complete new rebrand and the suite of signage that would go with that. And the estimated cost for about all of that was half a million pounds. The branding exercise itself cost in the region of, of five thousand pounds. Phase two then, which has not long been completed, was to create Ireland's greatest adventure play trail. And it was a capital project worth about £850,000. Half a million of that came from RDP Tourism Fund and the remaining portion was funded by the Council. And phase three, which is forecast for 2021, is already starting, is for the design and build of a new visitor centre at Gosford, as well as a new car park and extension to the existing car park. And that is a capital project of about £3 million which is wholly being funded by the Council. I just want to now show you some highlights, highlights of what has been created and completed at Gosford. In 2019, when the trails were actually launched, the numbers were recorded in the year were 23,000. 
But in this last year, 2020, this COVID year, the number has doubled. They're now 43,000. And that just really highlights how important this resource is to people during COVID and during lockdowns. Instead of the usual photos here, I just included a short video taken from YouTube to show how some people are using and enjoying the trails. During the early planning stages of this project, we knew Gosford represented a very significant opportunity to do something along the lines of play. Play on a scale like nowhere else in the island of Ireland. And that really became ours and the Council's vision to create Ireland's greatest adventure play trail. The play trail at Gosford is made up of five standalone iconic play pieces, all of which are made totally from natural materials and are designed on the different but unique elements of Gosford's character. For example, the giant was inspired by Jonathan Swift or Dean Swift, Swift who wrote Gulliver's Travels and is reported to have spent a lot of free time, his free time at Gosford as he was close friends with the Earl and even closer with the Lady Gosford if the tales are to be believed. The woodpecker's nest gives special reference to the woodpeckers that once nested in Gosford. And the castle takes its obvious inspiration from Gosford Castle. And the projects don't stop there. 2021 sees the exciting start of phase three and the design and the build of the new visitor centre and car parking facilities. That concludes my presentation and now we move to my interview with Greg Pearson. Hi Greg, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about Gosford and the project from a council perspective. Greg, can you take us right back to the beginning and tell me what Gosford used to be like before development started? The council back in the Armagh day before RPA had Loch All Country Park as their sort of main um, outdoor site. And I think then when RPA and the councils came together, there was a recognition that Gosford would be another beautiful site, you know, to develop. Now, I suppose back then there wouldn't have been any sort of main trails, a few walking routes possibly. Uh, the maintenance wouldn't have been that great. Numbers maybe in a year would have been about 80,000 people. Um, no dedicated sort of caravan areas that were developed to a high standard. Um, so the council basically just wanted to have a top quality outdoor country park, um, similar to Loch Gall, um, that would be of great benefit for the community. Um, so what, what was specifically, Greg, can you think back to the council's vision for developing Gosford? Well, I know the, the management um, at that time had been over to look at some of the big sites over in the UK mainland. And these would be international sites that were recognised for bringing in you know, tourists. So the council sort of at that early stage decided that's the way they wanted to go. The master plan was done and then that was that was followed up by an economic appraisal that looked at almost the total wish list of things and looked at the options from doing nothing to doing everything. And after that process, it meant the council could have complete faith that all of their decision making, applying for funding applications, they, they could make the business case for why they're wanting to develop Gosford um, with their preferred option, which I think came to about a total of five million pounds, wasn't it, Greg, development that the council were committing with external support? Yes, and obviously they wanted to ensure that it would be sustainable and that there would be an income stream coming in sort of to match that as well. The figures that are sort of, or the income that we're getting now is way, way ahead of what was anticipated and just actually shows how popular a site it is. Thinking holistically, what do you say as manager has been the greatest successes of the development and investment in Gosford? Um, I suppose the first thing is the sheer number of visitors that are now coming to Gosford. Um, as I say, back when Forest Service managed it, you had maybe 80,000 visitors in a year. 
and we're looking now 350,000 visitors plus. Yeah. Now, obviously, um, with COVID and the shutdown of a lot of indoor facilities, more people now are conscious of you know their mental health and getting out into the outdoors. And Gosford has definitely benefited from that. What do you think has been the challenges or what are the challenges um, that face Gosford now? Obviously, the biggest issue from, well, it was an issue before um, Council took it over, back and forest service management was still an issue, is the car parking. Um, now, we have uh, phase three coming up, which uh, will concentrate initially on car parking. Um, it's the parking of cars out on the roadside um, before uh, they come into Gosford. And we're, we've been trying to sort that out for months along with DFI and PSNI. And we don't believe that even if we increase our car parking to 700 spaces, that that will necessarily solve the problem. Yeah. Other issues, I suppose, because it's such a big site, would be general maintenance. So you have the maintenance of all the trails and the sheer numbers of people in, you know, litter picking, all the general maintenance that goes with a site of that size. Um, now, obviously, we were getting far more visitors than we had initially anticipated. And we did a sort of a staff structure at the start, which we now sort of know isn't adequate to deal with the numbers of people coming in. And we're going to have to revisit that as well. And I suppose that's what the, the review of the economic appraisal will do now in preparation for phase three starting um, is, is look at that and the financial side of things, the income and the staff structure. Yes, obviously, um, with the increased numbers, we were sitting in our first year, we were getting our income that was anticipated for year four. Um, we're up to 350,000 visitors. So generally going to be focusing on the car parking and how we increase that uh, staff and structure uh, for the management and um, looking at the income, other possible areas for development. Just to point out that actually on the car parking side of things, and, and you rightly say they're, they're just you'll always get people that don't want to pay. You only actually charge five pounds um, for a day's car parking at Gosford, which hasn't changed even after the developments and the interventions of, of cycle trails, walk trails, um, and the play was put in. So it's it's not a lot of money to pay for, as you say, a, a full day out. What do you think has been the impact of, of the project at Gosford? What differences do you think it has made and, and who has it benefited most? I think there's no sort of um, particular one group that you could say it has um, benefited the most. It basically benefited the whole community. Now, obviously, if the local community and it's on their doorstep and that's their go to place, you know, every weekend or, you know, even during the week, we find that it's, it's just busy. Yeah. So we're looking at the ability to have 700 car parking spaces. Um, and it's, it's fitting that in on the site in such a way that mm. it's not just black tarmac everywhere. Yes. If it's getting incorporated into grass areas by using a reinforced matting that enhances the look of, you know, of the, the park, but still provides car parking. Yeah. Now we also have, we also got grant funding uh, last year to put in glamping pods. Okay. Uh, and we specified that they have to be focused on accessibility. So you have the caravan park there already, and you're going to add that additional offering then of, of the glamping pods as well. Yeah. Very exciting. In terms of accommodation, is there any other plans in the future, maybe to have more forest holiday type accommodation? If the glamping pods work initially, then we've identified a, a site just sits outside of woodland area that we would want to maybe focus on a, a high quality glamping pod area, maybe 12 to 15 pods. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, that will be a help with income generation as well. Become much more than just a nice family day out. It will fulfill that original council vision of creating that forest holiday type experience. Yeah. 
Fantastic. It all sounds very exciting. There's obviously very uh, plenty of plans of fit for Gosford. So it'll be a case of watch this space over the next few years anyway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Greg, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you sharing your experiences um, about the development of Gosford from a from a council perspective. Um, there's no doubt now that it ranks as one of the most popular and unique forests in, in Northern Ireland. And we very much look forward to seeing all the exciting developments transpire in the future. Thanks very much, Greg. No problem, Fiona. Thank you. And I finally be finished on a short interview with Aubrey Bingham from Disability Sport NI, who will be talking about all out trekking. Hi, Aubrey. Thank you for joining me today. As introduction for the audience, Aubrey is from Disability Sport Northern Ireland, the organisation who was responsible for the setup and delivery of all out trekking at Gosford Forest Park. But Aubrey, can you start by telling me how all out trekking came to be in Gosford Forest Park? Yes, certainly. Thanks very much for inviting me along, uh, Fiona. So I suppose it started up uh, a few years ago, pro probably around 2018, and uh, it came through, um, there's a forum was set up called Active Living No Limits. They developed um, a plan uh, from that forum to try to address the underrepresentation of people with disabilities in sport, physical activity, sort of that wide range. And one of the aspects was outdoor recreation. And we went, me and another guy, Brian, from the organisation, went around a number of parks and we were looking at things like where the park was situated, whether there were suitable toilets for people with disabilities, parking, and the general sort of ambience, I suppose, of the of the park. And when we got to Gosford, we saw at Gosford, I'd never been there before, and I thought, this looks absolutely fabulous. Now I must say it was a lovely sunny day and uh, it showed it in all its glory. And uh, we had a um, girl called Kelly Rushton who was working for, or does work for the council, the ABC council. And she showed us around the, the trails which had just been developed, the mountain bike trails. And we thought this is fantastic. So um, it went from there. Um, Department for Communities uh, confirmed the funding with us and uh, what we did was we set up two testing days basically at Gosford where we invited a range of manufacturers of different uh, pieces of equipment along and a number of people with disabilities. We decided on which, which piece of equipment we were going to purchase and we wanted to have a, a, a range of equipment so we were we knew that at Gosford there was uh, walking trails, horse riding, mountain bike trails, etc. But uh, we thought let's utilise, have buggies that operate on the walking trails and different buggies which are suited for the mountain bike trails. We purchased the um, terrain hoppers, which are four wheel buggies, electric powered bug, battery powered buggies. Uh, and we have a different set of equipment called Quadrix which are again four wheel battery powered buggies, um, but they're a lot more dynamic, a lot more nimble and agile and faster and are suited to uh, the mountain bike trails. Wow, OK, yeah, great. Yeah, that explains perfectly, Aubrey, just the prerequisites that you'd be looking for a site and, and how Gosford came about, really, um, and the history of the of the project. Can you tell me, though, you've explained really well what type of buggies you have and how each of those sit different trails and trains uh, terrains but who who uses the buggies who are they designed for um so two types of buggies we have um the train hoppers and the and the quadrix and they're suitable for a way so the project is aimed at people getting people with disabilities uh, people with health conditions and their friends and family out on the trails together. So the buggies can be operated by people with disabilities and non-disabled people. And that's won't be one of the successes of the project. And in terms of the, the Quadrix machines and the mountain bike trails, we can go around 95% of the trails in Gosford. So, uh, I mean, we've had people out who have partially sighted physical disabilities, you know, permanent wheelchair users, amputees, we've had people with autism, learning disability, brain injuries. We also have a hoist system in the in the store, which enables us to, for those people with very high levels 
of um, disability, maybe be a power chair user, and we have the hoist system in place now. What, what do you see has been the impact or what the difference has that all out trekking has had at Gosford? And it's actually opened up people's eyes in terms of different people with disabilities who said to us, I'm not sure, I heard about the project, I'm not sure I could operate it. We have sort of sent them a little video or explained to them, asked them to come down beforehand and have a wee look at the buggies. And um, there's been nobody that we haven't been able to take out yet. And um, what are the future plans for all out trekking at Gosford? We hope to, excuse me, start again in April. April or May time and we also hope to add in a mountain bike hire element and we hope to also develop um, a program which is suited to blind and partially sighted people. And I think that's a nice sweet point to finish on and um, we do have a little video actually of the impact that it's made and, and see some of the hoppers and the equipment in use there so I suppose it's just last thing for me to say is thank you very much Aubrey for your time today for sharing with us the story and success of, of all out trekking at Gosford. Okay, folks, um, you know what? Sometimes it just doesn't work the way you want it to. So apologies, we haven't been able to share the two videos um, on Gosford. Um, but what a great project, what a transformation of an unloved, underused space. Um, just to see the figures and um, the numbers that are going through that forest park now. Um, and in many ways, it's really been a victim of its own success because you've heard Greg there um, chatting about the challenges they now have as the management body, the council as the management body. But I think what is particularly lovely about Gosford is the all out trekking because we heard from the research this morning um, just about some of the groups that are on represented in their use of the outdoors and one of those was people with a disability. So what a fantastic project to have in Gosford and when you hear Aubrey and the enthusiasm of them and every time I see Aubrey and his groups out in Gosford they always have a huge smile on their face so they are really really enjoying getting out and using the outdoors so um, hopefully there'll be more uh, trails and all out tracking facilities across Northern Ireland um, to help that group of our population enjoy the outdoors more. So uh, finally, uh, the third presentation of this afternoon is going to be a live presentation and it's all about a project that's been ongoing for the last couple of years in County Fermanagh, uh, the Quilka de Clanish project engaging the community. Chris Scott from Outdoor Recreation NI is going to lead the presentation and we're also going to have then contributions from Barney Devine from Clanish Community Association, Martina O'Neill from the Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark and from the funder of the project Paul Mullen from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So Chris if you're ready I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much, Carolyn. We'll have to get your uh, your Fermanagh accent in check. It's Culka de You're far you're far you're far too well refined in your pronunciation. Um, no, you'll be glad you'll be glad to see. I I, I haven't brought any videos, but as you said, I, I brought I brought a few friends along. Um, I'm going to start uh, first of all just with a with a brief presentation on the, on the Culka de Clinish project, just to give people a flavour of of what we've been doing for the for the last couple of years and and what we intend to do uh, and until project exit. And then, as I said, we've got some uh, conversation with Paul, Martina, uh, and Barney, and uh, we've only got 20 minutes, um, which will go around very fast. But we, we obviously have an opportunity to flesh some of those questions out further in, in the breakout room, which which follows this event. So just bear with me, folks. I'm just going to share my screen a wee second. Um, OK, so um, yeah, so Kulka de Klinish and really the theme of this is all about uh, community, community engagement. Um, 
So uh, the project, as Karen said, was was primarily funded by, by the Heritage Fund. It's a £300,000 project across across three years. The Heritage Fund provided 270000 of that. The match funding then came from Fermanagh and Oma District Council. So, so we have a broad range of partners. Um, to me, it's a really authentic community project. The community are, are, are right in there as key decision makers. Kalesha Community Development Association and Cleanish Community Development Association, along with ourselves as, as lead partner uh, and the Geopark. So, and that's the, the management team you can see there in, in, in the photograph. So just to let people know where um, where Kolkata Klinish is, um, you can see the sort of orange boundary line there uh, at the at the north of the map there. You can just see the outskirts of, of Inneskillen. So if you were driving into Inneskillen, you'd be coming in that road there. So we're about seven miles or so southwest of, of Inneskillen. Maybe you'll be familiar, you will be familiar with the Marble Arch Caves, the, the, the Kulka um, a Boardwalk and a Florence Court House there, for example, a National Trust uh, property. So just to give you a little bit of orientation in the key communities of, of Kalesher, uh, Arnie, Klinish and, and Val and Alec are some of the key communities we've been working with uh, through, through that project. And really, it, the community trail plan, which I'll talk about more in a wee second, has been the central pillar. Um, developing community trails takes time. Um, they certainly don't happen overnight from, from sort of idea to, to delivery on the ground. So how we designed this project with the community was to give us that space and time to develop the community trails. A lot of the other meanwhile projects took place alongside that. So to allow people uh, to be inspired, to engage and to explore their built and archaeological heritage, their, their natural heritage, and of course the, the people and the culture within, within the area as well. So it meant that we didn't really feel as much under pressure to give that, that running commentary on, on the trails piece when there was so many other exciting things uh, going on if we did it. And I think that was really key and the funding from the Heritage Fund really did give us that space and time to do that, to build up trust and build up those relationships with the, with the community. So um, we did a number of, of very exciting things and outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland, as the name suggests, have no track record whatsoever in, in this sort of stuff. So um, we uh, contracted the services of Barney Devine, um, who you'll hear from in a minute, who has really um, you know, driven forward all these events. And this is only a, a small sample of underground concerts in the Marble Arch Caves getting folk out canoeing on the Arnie River, which they have journeyed around over for years, but maybe never ever been on, a community archaeological dig, loads of really engaging uh, history and heritage talks, a uh, recording of uh, acoustic uh, bells and so on. So I could go on actually for ages with the, the, the incredible amount of projects that's delivered. But again, that's what's engaged the community. That's what's got them on board. I feel if we just did the community trail piece, it wouldn't have worked. So having that broader connection has been has been fantastic. Um, the, 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 I should also say is that the guys have pivoted really well during COVID and done a lot of stuff online digitally. So so go to c2c.org.uk. I'm sure the guys will share that in the, in the question panel and you can have a look at some of the really good digital activities that the guys have done over the last uh, couple of months or indeed the last year all of a sudden. Um, but as I say, those, those meanwhile projects give us an opportunity to, to meet people and chat people and start talking about the community trails. So where do they walk? Where would they like to walk? Where is the built and natural heritage they would like to engage with through the community trail project? So you can see lots of conversation. You can see in the background, lots of tea, lots of coffee drank, lots of really good conversation. And that was a really useful process for us. And the, the community connection there brought people to the room and brought people to the conversation that I, Chris Scott, parachuting in from Belfast, could never have achieved in a local community uh, in County Fermanagh or any other rural area in Northern Ireland for, for that matter. And the best of all is we delivered results. And this is the most exciting bit of it for us as outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland. Um, but also you can see that the, the clear link to the heritage aspect as well. So this trail is being built as we speak at the moment, um, thanks to funding from both again, from the Heritage Fund and from, from, from DERA Environment Fund. And you can see there uh, a, a 1.9 kilometre trail, a line folk engage and, and overlook the site of the Battle of Fort of the Biscuits. But fundamentally, there are nine landowners there who have entered into permissive path agreements um, with the local council. That community engaged those landowners, that community got those landowners on board. We'll talk more about that in, 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 the, in the questions. 
Likewise, we have Nixon Hall Trail, again, contractors on site now, fantastic, two and a half kilometres, another great opportunity to engage with the natural and built heritage of, of, of the area. And one that's in the works then is the Arnie River Canoe Trail. So this is upper and, and lower uh, Loch McNean, heading along the Arnie River towards Loch Earn and on upwards then towards, towards Inniskillen, joining the Loch Earn Canoe Trail, which we put on the water in 2005. Um, so again, lots of access points here that require private landowner access that the local community, facilitated by us and helped by us, have knocked on the doors, drank the cups of tea, drank the cups of coffee and got those landowners on board. And that's been a really interesting process for us. So in summary, it's all about those partnerships, ourselves, the community and landowners working together, and of course the council and Martinez team in the Geopark coming in to, to back us up on that. Um, so I'm conscious that's a that's a, a real a real whistle stop of a of a two and a half year piece of work, um, but hopefully it gives you a flavour of what we've been trying to achieve over over the last wee while. So, I have a couple of, of questions now. I'm hopefully going to do a little bit less talking now, and I have a couple of of, of questions. Um, uh, we want to we want to chat around, and Carolyn, I'm sure, will shake her fist at me when she wants me to when she wants me to stop, and we'll we'll pass over to, to Minister Weir. Um, but um, the first one then, um, and I'm going to come to you, Barney, first, uh, if that's okay. Um, and it really is. So, from your perspective, as as you know, a, a local community representative, obviously you've been involved in project delivery, but what have been the benefits and challenges to you um, from your perspective from that sort of partnership community approach? What have been the benefits? But tell us the challenges too. You're on mute there, Barney, just flick your microphone off. Yeah. Good man. Thank you very much. Um, the benefits are really um, Uh, and as a champion for greater access to our heritage, uh, a programme like this where local people identify what is important to them in the landscape uh, and for them to get access to that is worth so, so much. Um, and the activities that you build around people to give them ownership of their own heritage um, highlights to them how important their own place is and what they have is important and that they can be proud to share it with others. And by getting people involved in activities and the fun and the crack you have, I mean, you know, our previous project was Battles, Bricks and Bridges. We lit the blue touch paper. We had such fun people engaging with their past heritage and so on and so forth. And then getting into archeology span and identifying and finding things that they'd heard about but didn't really know about. Once they know it, once they get it, then you can say, what about getting a trail up around there? What about the other community development stuff around health and well-being engagement? And everybody got it and landowners got it. And they says, yeah, OK. And you mentioned that one around the battlefield. That was nine landowners and that was all agreed in one hour looking over a map. And there wasn't a bottle of whiskey on the table. It was tea that night. I wasn't there, but I think you were there that night. You were amazed at how easy it was. But it comes easy when you get people interested in what they have all around them. And it's that key to me is the most important point. And if I can also just say years ago, a mentor of mine came to me and I was working and my desk was full of papers. And he said, what you need is someone to come in with a sweep of the arm and clear the papers off your desk. And I said, wouldn't that be a fine thing? So about four years ago, Chris came in and he said, can I sweep all them papers off your desk? And we'll look after the admin, the governance, the finance, and all the reporting we have to do to Paul Mullen and colleagues, and let you get on with unlocking all the heritage that you have in your area and see what we can do together. And that's the background to this project. Paul, I have to say, I do very little reporting and admin back to you and your <laughs> colleagues. Great, Barney. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you've obviously you've obviously seen the the, the paper on my desk then, because <laughs> it's it's oh, plentiful yeah. at the moment. Um, Martina, I'm going to come to you next before we before we go to Paul on that theme. So from from your side, the, the geopark side, CTCs fully integrated in, in your landscape. Um, so what what's been the benefits and, and challenges uh, for for you? 
Well, well, absolutely, Chris. When we were given the opportunity, I think, to be part of this project, we jumped at it um, straight away from a council con a context and indeed from a DO Park context, because in essence, the ethos of this project is very much aligned to what UNESCO Global Geo Parks are actually all about. They're about participation, they're about partnership and about community engagement. But more importantly, as I say, it's not just about the participation, it's about giving local people that ownership and that control over the decision making process, over the management and the governance um, in there. So it's been a fantastic um, learning curve, I think, certainly for me personally, but also professionally as well, because I think what we've been able to deliver in a very small but rich geographical area um, in Kolkata Cleanage is really something that we can take valuable lessons from and replicate um, across the board. And I think the key with the partnerships is obviously that, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, when you look at the people around the table, you have that local engagement, that ownership, that motivation is there to deliver and do. And people become really enthused about the heritages on their own doorstep and really want to work with you in terms of sharing that with others. And once you get that understanding and awareness of what's there, then hopefully we will, as Barney says, get that custodianship and that ownership and that legacy that we're all looking for to make sure that those trails are there in the future and the fantastic features that they allow us to see and visit, that they are, uh, it seems to me that they're also there. So from our perspective, the benefits um, far outweigh the challenges, certainly from, if anything, the significant challenge has been, is maybe from our perspective and also being a council is sometimes trying to curb that enthusiasm just slightly, um, I think, in terms of, of making sure that what we can deliver, that we are true to what we're going to do and continue to deliver and, and maybe just having that fair hand um, at times as and when it's needed. Um, but certainly the tea and biscuits um, help to have those difficult conversations over, that's for sure. Great, Martina, thank you. You really well articulated there. Paul, you've obviously, you know, it's the funding from the Heritage Fund that's made, made this partnership possible and made this activity possible. How, how have you seen it as a funder from, from, from your perspective? Very positively indeed. I mean, this came out of a scheme that we had developed called Great Place. And the idea, I suppose, was to really build on this idea of network heritage. And that's where you've got different organisations, different communities and different people trying to work together in a, in a constructive way. Because certainly in all our years at the Heritage Fund, you know, what we know is good good projects have good people behind them. And again, this project was building on, as Barney indicated, the battles, bricks and bridges and the successes of that. And so really, it was down to yourselves in terms of presenting the ideas to us, um, you know, how the, uh, those experiences from previous projects could really be built on in a way that would directly involve communities. And for us, heritage, you know, heritage is it's all about people. It's all about communities, but it's about your place, your home place. And what we've learned through this whole COVID period is how important that sense of locality is. So a project like this is really drawing on all of those different themes I've mentioned there in a, in a very powerful way. And to be able to leave something so tangible on the ground at the end of it, I think is critical as well. Um, and the fact that you've had landowners, the communities, you know, everybody else working to that one one end. That's what makes our job as a funder uh, uh, so enjoyable. Great, Paul, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, just from our perspective, uh, just from our perspective as well, then, and funny just to pick up, I mean, we, we have really enjoyed the, the project. It's been it's been a phenomenal experience actually. It's the first time we have really worked with communities for this length of time and to be as as, as ingrained with communities. We've been made feel incredibly welcome uh, in, in the area. Um, I, I think as Martina mentioned though the challenge for us therefore has been been to um, manage those expectations because Quite often, folk who, who work in, in community groups and, and engage with these projects, their enthusiasm is fantastic. But here, like, 
they don't understand the crazy world that we all work in as, as outdoor recreation developers of planning permissions and heritage permissions and permissions from HED and NED and funders and lining up funding applications. And it's just, I mean, putting community trails in the ground, putting outdoor recreation projects in the ground, we putting any project on the ground in Northern Ireland, as you all know, as delegates is, 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 is hugely challenging. Um, so it's, it's, it's been great to have the meanwhile projects going on that if we'd been having to keep that absolute running commentary on the trails at each time, you know, it would have been a real challenge for us. So um, it's still been a challenge um, and it still will continue to be a challenge, but it's just wonderful now. Like it's wonderful now to see contractors on the ground putting those trails in the ground and wonderful now to see a whole range of legacy projects um, coming out of the piece as well. OK, um, I, I'm getting sent messages here, so um, I have time for one more question, Carolyn. Yeah, um, so one more question then really, and of course a lot of the project is around the relationship between outdoor recreation and, and, and heritage then. And um, I suppose I'm going to come to you again first, Barney, if that's OK. So what has been the key way for you that the project has, has demonstrated that, that relationship or delivered on that relationship for you? Um, between um, outdoor recreation and um, heritage, Chris, is that what you're saying? Indeed. Yeah. Um, you know, I I look at heritage and I've worked in heritage now for six or seven years. I kind of fell into it, but to me, it's everywhere. It is everywhere, and we are so limited in our access to it. And the access issue, the access to local heritage, and the benefits that that can bring, we haven't even touched the surface of it, the top of the iceberg. I really do believe that the challenge from a policy point of view, Northern Ireland, and you're now at the forefront of that policy in terms of giving people meaningful access, um, must focus on heritage. If Outdoor Recreation NI was to work more in partnership with heritage organisations, with policy makers, and open up what local people are being denied, which is access to private land, um, open that up. Get the access debate sorted, get it um, in such a way that it's not an impediment where people are frightened to go into a field to look at a castle or a monument or whatever the case might be. But it all belongs to them, it's all of our heritage. And that to me is the big challenge that's going to be facing us all. Um, and to the heritage world, they have to become more relaxed about giving people more access to that. Um, we have to find ways to let it happen. The uh, indemnity model that we're currently working here is a fantastic one where the council and the geopark are looking after that in the legacy element of the work that we've done so far in putting trails on the ground. But compared with the Republic of Ireland, with England, Wales, Scotland, we're nowhere near where we could be. And that's the big challenge facing you guys. I won't be around to pursue all that and to continue it, but uh, I'm very, very pleased to have been part of the debate up until now, but there's more to be done. Oh, you'll be you'll be around for a while, yeah, Barney, I would say. Um, I, Martina, I'm going to come to you on that one. Obviously, outdoor recreation and heritage, key components of the geopark. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, Chris, and, and certainly on that, we'll, we'll be taking Barney along with us now. There's, no, there's certainly no fear on, on letting him go just yet um, in relation to it. But yeah, absolutely. And I concur with everything Barney has said there um, from our perspective. And, um, you know, we made some very valid, very relevant points. Um, specifically, I think from, from our perspective is I, I do absolutely concur that you need that access in order to fully understand and appreciate the landscape and the unique heritage it holds. You have to see it. You know, that's one of the disadvantages of this virtual world is, is trying to bring this to life, to reality, for people to really experience that heritage. But I suppose key to a geopark perspective is that that's done sustainably. You know, it, it's done sustainably in terms of environmentally, that it's in the most appropriate location and um, that it can be. So it gives you that access, but it still helps to protect and conserve what you're there to see. Socially, as this project has demonstrated, the need to engage stakeholders and local communities in particular, and they really should be at the top of that stakeholder engagement and that pyramid in there. They are critical and economically. You know, we have to look in terms of the whole life costs, I'm sure from Paul's perspective, in terms of the value for money from a, a funding perspective, but also the longevity and the management maintenance um, arrangements that you would put in place in terms of recreation. So 
for me and I think a geopark perspective, sustainability is absolutely key and into the long term because these are active, dynamic landscapes. You know, the way we see it today is not what it's going to be like in six months time and it's not what it's going to be like in 12 months time. So you've got to have that long term commitment as well to the review, to the monitoring and to keeping the engagement at the levels they once were as well. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Martina. And then just lastly from, from Paul, then obviously, Paul, you know, connection to, to landscapes and so on is, is, is a key part of your sort of revised framework over the last year or so. Very much so. Well, it's it's not just over the last year or so. Um, really goes back a um, um, uh, decade and a half through our landscape partnership type schemes. So um, landscapes are incredibly important, um, but it's the whole picture and it's thinking strategically. I mean, Barney touched on various points about access there and we were, I was talking to him the other day and he was saying about how, you know, 95% of, of um, heritage sites are in private ownership. And, um, you know, that's something that restricts the ability to people to sort of uh, engage in their heritage. And that's where I think we all work together. And there's a great role for outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland and all of this because, I mean, you, you, you know how to create access in a way that nobody else can. And um, again, as I touched on earlier, the COVID situation has shown just how valuable sort of locality and heritage in our locality is, is, is for people. So we've got to bring all of these different strands together and um, to you know, convince the powers that be that more needs to be done. Great, Paul, thank you. And, and it's actually been really interesting in the project in terms of our learning as, as well. Um, you know, when I actually look at the Arnie Battlefield Trail, I wonder if it hadn't been through a heritage project like this, would we as outdoor recreation have, have developed a trail like that? I'm not so sure. But actually, from listening to Barney and listening to his community colleagues, it's really clear the connection and appreciation they have of the battle site and, and the place that battle had in their local heritage. And therefore the trail is a key way of exploring that. I'm not sure we would have developed it without getting that understanding from the community. Likewise with Nixon Hall and likewise with elements of the Canoe Trail. So this this process, this, this C2C process has been a really useful learning experience for, for me and my colleagues. And just to, to take you up on your challenge, I'll assure you we're up for that. Um, myself and my colleagues are up for it. We we do firmly believe we and we agree. And C2C has showed that increasing the connection and access to our our built and natural heritage is vital going forward. And C2C has, has, has taught us that every day we've been there. So so yeah, we're up for the challenge. I can I can guarantee you that, Paul, Martina, and Barney. And I know you're all with us. So so that's great. Carolyn, I think I think that's us. Yeah, Paul, uh, Martina, Barney. Thanks a million. And we'll discuss further in the breakout rooms. Thank you. Okay, Chris, thank you so much for that. And to Barney, to Paul and Martina, um, just let me say, I'll try again the Kulka the Clanish project. Um, uh, hopefully that's better pronunciation this time around, but no, it really is just a fantastic project. And I've had the, the privilege of spending the day with Barney out on the ground, walking the, uh, the Battlefield Trail and the Nixon Hall Trail. And it really is such a beautiful place, first of all, to get out into the outdoors, but it's also really a brilliant community project. Um, we had hoped at this stage um, to bring in our fifth minister for the day, uh, Minister of Education, uh, Peter Weir. He has arrived on our screen just as I speak. Well, Minister, you're very, very welcome to the conference this afternoon. We're delighted to have you on and I'll just let you continue with a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for the event. I, I want to congratulate you on the success of today's conference and the launch of the uh, outdoor recreation Northern Ireland strategic plan. I think the event has Im improved recognition of how our wealth, health and well-being are directly affected by the quality of the environment around us. I think that's something that's been very much, if it's not something that people didn't realise before, it's been very much um, reinforced by the events of the last year with COVID. 
the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I think it's important that, that any environmental improvements that protect health or encourage more healthy lifestyles will have long lasting benefits, not physically and, and mentally. And I know that the draft programme for government identifies key actions aimed at improving and protecting the environment, uh, which will benefit everyone in Northern Ireland, including and obviously particularly my department's focus, children and young people. The pandemic and the lockdown in particular have been characterised as causing a widespread sense of uncertainty and anxiety, leading to increased levels of stress. And the mental and emotional well-being of children and young people continues to be a high priority for myself and my department. And I recognise the critical importance for children of play and spending time in the outdoors, both for their development, physical health, and well-being. And, you know, well, I suspect probably it was, was as with a lot of people, I share this with a lot of people on the, the call today, it's a little while since it's been my own childhood. I remember the uh, enriching experience of outdoor recreation, that access to historic monuments outdoors, uh, and indeed, uh, the, you know, the, the great environment we have in Northern Ireland enriched my life as a, as a young person, and to translate that into uh, where we are today, I think, becoming even more important. I suppose our overall aim within the department is to empower young people to take care of their own emotional health and happiness, trying to build in that resilience and indeed um, as a way of facing the challenges that will inevitably occur in the future. And we're all working towards a time when there will be fewer children will require specialist prevention for mental health uh, services. So I can assure you that both my department and the Education Authority recognises that many social and emotional issues that children and their families are facing, which have been particularly exacerbated because of the COVID restrictions, brought many challenges, uh, new challenges to us. But as we uh, start to recover and hopefully move beyond the situation in which COVID has that dominant impact on our lives, I think we've got to recognise not only the importance of getting outdoors, but work to ensure that children continue to have access to those outdoor opportunities. Uh, recently, along with the Department of Health, uh, last Friday, I jointly launched the Children and Young People's Emotional Health and Wellbeing an education framework. Uh, we'll be working collaboratively with uh, departments like the Department of Health, Public Health, Health and Social Care, Education Authority to implement that framework. In addition to the work on additional investment in schools, EAU service in partnership with Public Health has developed a model of youth work practice, providing qualified youth workers with specific training and experience in mental health. And the aim is to support uh, young people uh, throughout. It's important that, that our children and young people have an understanding, I think, and a respect for the environment. They are very much the next generation. And um, what I think so many people on, on this conference have given, dedicated so many years to, it's important that's carried forward by our young people. And I think there is a strong sense of that environment. The opportunities for that respect for the environment are provided. Uh, are provided for them is critical as well to access and interact with the natural world both at home and in school and that I think for all of us there's a challenge to improve and enhance the quality of outdoor engagements which they live learn and play so that's why I'm delighted to see as one of the key priorities for outdoor recreation Northern Ireland is the increased uh, nature and adventure play provisions throughout Northern Ireland I think that is absolutely critical as we move forward I think there are many uh, benefits that organisations such as yourselves uh, working alongside DE and the various offshoots of education that we can all achieve by working together. I think, if anything, I think the events of the last year have focused that in uh, as being utterly vital, uh, the collaboration in that coordinated way to ensure environmental improvements, to protect the physical health and encourage more healthy lifestyles. And I think that's a potential win-win for all of us. So look, thank you. I appreciate you going to go into your breakout session. But I just want to thank you as was in conclusion for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. And I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much, Minister Weir. That is just a, a lovely ending to our conference today. In many ways, really completes the circle of ministerial input today because what we have seen 
without a doubt today is just uh, the cross cutting nature of outdoor recreation. And just in conclusion, um, before we go to our breakout rooms, um, you know, I really feel I've been in this business now for 25 years and I really feel at present it is a really, really exciting time for outdoor recreation. Um, there's something a move um, and it it's definitely feels good. I mean, we now today have the hard evidence to show the value that uh, getting into the outdoors can have. We can now confidently feed in for the first time probably ever into government strategies and policies. So we can feed into the environment strategy, the green growth strategy, the sport and physical activity strategy, the strategy minister where you have just mentioned, you know, so for the first time we really feel as if we can contribute to government's priorities and outcomes and even at a local level, the research that Elizabeth mentioned earlier on social return and investment on very small things like community trails. We now have that evidence to put to government. So it really is an exciting time for us. Um, but having said all of that, we at Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland, you know, we can play our part at a strategic level to try and influence policy. But having heard the sessions from this afternoon, the three presentations, community really is everything going forward for us in our work. And, and I think Martina said it, she said community should be at the top of the stakeholder pyramid. And that is so true. And so we look forward to working with more and more communities as we go forward, working collaboratively too with local government and central government and hoping to pursue our own vision of trying to create a happier, healthier society where people appreciate the outdoors. So I hope you find today in some way valuable, uh, but we now have an opportunity to go into our breakout rooms uh, to be able to chat more about what we've heard today. But just before we do, can I just thank uh, on behalf of Outdoor Recreation I all the speakers this afternoon uh, for all of their input, those who were live and those who were pre-recorded. Uh, to Minister Weir for coming in uh, just to conclude the conference. Um, and also a big thank you to all the staff from Outdoor Recreation who are behind the scenes working all the computers, trying to get the videos to work, putting up the presentations, trying to get everybody queued in. There's a lot of stress going on behind uh, the scenes uh, there and that's just uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work very well, but we appreciate you sticking with us. Um, Stay connected to us, please, through our Twitter, our LinkedIn and our YouTube channel. And after today's event, we will be sending out a post event easing where you'll be able to get all the presentations from today, the research that we produced today, um, our new strategic plan for 20 to 25. So that will all go out tomorrow. So on behalf of Outdoor Recreation and I, can I just again thank you all for attending. Hopefully we'll see you all soon. Uh, hopefully it won't be online this time next year. Our conference will all be actually together in a physical room. But uh, thank you again and I hope you enjoy your breakout rooms. <laughs>